I work in their mainframe division. So mainframes basically run our uh, flight booking systems. Whenever you book a flight, you're using mainframe. If you bank, you're using mainframe. And I help write the documentation for uh, the products that Broadcom has for that, um, specifically a product called CA Disk and CA Allocate. I've been there about three months now, and I got that job just by applying, going through an interview process, and just showing enough for them, even though my resume was apparently a little thin, that it was my aptitude to learn that got me that job. Um, that's basically been the story of my entire career. Four years? Yes, four years. I uh, graduated from UNT in December of 2015. Um, a lot of the tools that we use, we're actually going through a tool migration right now uh, from what used to be called um, Doc Ops to Adobe Experience Manager, and that's proven to be a little interesting to say the least. And that's something as well that in my professional career has actually impacted a lot. I've used everything from Salesforce to SharePoint to Adobe Experience Manager, uh, to a little bit of Madcap Flare as well. And so one of the biggest recommendations that I have for you starting out your technical communication career is try and be as tool agnostic as you can be. So that way, if you go into an interview and they tell you what we're using X tool or Y tool, you have a degree of familiarity with that tool that you can then um, start developing your professional career as well. Um, a little bit of a background for me, I'm actually a history major first and foremost. I dovetailed into technical communication when I realized that the job prospects for a history major weren't that great. I was actually part of Orange cohort as well when we came through UNT together. And the tools and the classes that TechCon put on are incomparable. They have really helped me earn a lot of my jobs that I have, everything from being an IT communication specialist, to a proposal writer to now a technical writer. Um, especially in the technical writer thread, you actually have a solid career progression path, which a lot of other jobs right now don't necessarily provide. So for instance, in Broadcom, I'm technical writer two right now, but there are four further promotions that I could earn up to being a principal technical writer um, before potentially exploring management. Um, so. Um, you really are in a strong, vibrant, growing community. Everyone needs technical writers, especially companies that think that communication and documentation isn't necessary. They very quickly learn otherwise. Um, <coughs> that's really all that I have. Um, I think one of the classes that best helped me was Dr. Lamb's Digital Literacies class. And uh, that was at the master's level. I'm not sure if he offers it at the... <coughs> Um, undergraduate level, but that's certainly something that I would highly recommend pursuing if you're able to. Um, that's a little bit about me, so unless you want to figure out where my accent came from, I'm welcome to take any questions. Mm -hmm. You should have questions. <coughs> um, so just because I did see also on your LinkedIn that you have two majors, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And you said the masters as well. Uh, um, that being said, and you've been in the field for four years? Yes. Okay. Um, so, don't mean to be rude, but how old were you when you graduated? Sure. So, I was uh, turning 30. Okay. How do you feel like that? Do you feel like uh, there was like, any age discrimination in the field? Not that I can tell. Okay. Um, I never put my age out there when I'm applying for jobs. I just present you myself. Know. Exactly. Um, there were a number in my cohort when I was graduating that were older than I am, mm -hmm. and they have and are experiencing solid careers even though they're older than me. Um, I won't embarrass them by saying how old, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as I can tell, the field is broad in terms of entry at any age, and okay. that's where it goes back to not necessarily having a piece of paper, but it's having the soft skills that companies are now looking for more so is sure. is my experience is that from all of the interview feedback that I got for the jobs I have been able to get, mm -hmm. it hasn't necessarily been on the strength of my resume as much as that helps. Yeah. But the soft skills that I provide with a positive attitude, a can do stuff, mm -hmm. um, the ability to learn, pick up things quickly oh. and share with us. <laughs> okay.
Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Sure. Um, no. 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 Okay. You said you were a tech writer too, and that there are like four different stages, and I was wondering if you could kind of go into that a bit more. Yes. So I'll, I'll try and remember because it was drinking from a fire hose when I first started. Um, so there are six levels. It starts off with a basic tech writer who's able to do, able to take instructions and do accordingly. The next step up is a technical writer two, where they are expected to take initiative and be able to stand on their own two feet and run a couple of product areas independently of the rest of the team. And then from there you go into a senior tech writer um, and then principal tech writer. I know that I'm missing something somewhere because I did say six. Um, it may be senior tech writer one, senior tech writer two, but it's increasing responsibility. And the biggest differentiator is not just experience, i.e. years in the profession, but also are you able to take initiative, are you able to identify problems before they arise, and most importantly take um, action or give examples or recommendations as to how to resolve those. Uh, Broadcom is actually uh, very good at identifying what each level is supposed to be able to do and then within my um, management group they even divide those broader categories down and provide more specific examples of what's expected for you to throw within the um, career progression. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that is. Okay. And then, when you spoke about um, flight booking documentation, can yes. you explain like what exactly you wrote about? So that's what Mainframe does. So main, so you have um, a couple of different types of systems. So all of these are individual laptops. Mainframe is basically a collection of servers that runs everything. So if you're booking flights or if you're booking hotel rooms, everything that you are seeing displayed to you through your website lives on a mainframe somewhere. And so I'm not necessarily specifically writing about flight booking software, I'm talking about the hardware that underpins everything. And so um, it's mainframes have been around since the 50s and 60s, they were the very first computers. If you ever see some of the early black and white photos of just a whole computer playing in an entire room, that's basically a mainframe and that still requires uh, what's called a dumb terminal that you type into so it goes off to the mainframe does whatever you tell it to and then it reports back. And part of what I'm doing is writing documentation that has involved the, uh, the way that you communicate with it. So for instance, CA disk, which is one of my product areas, that specifically talks about how much room is taken up on the mainframe and how you can access that, the tools that you can use to either compact something or archive it or move it around as necessary. Um, it's pretty cool, but it's also an education to me. I don't have a mainframe background, but that's the beauty of being a technical writer is that you don't necessarily need to have that specific subject matter knowledge, just as long as you're able to listen, uh, pass it, and um, spit it out the other end for a lay audience or a um, specialist audience, depending on who you're writing for. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two questions. Sure. Um, so the first one, going back to like the six stages and everything, mm -hmm. Um, so do you know like the time experience or like what is required to go to like the next level? Yes, so they do give guidelines as to how many years are expected for the various roles as well as what you're able to do. I can't recall anything specifically off the top of my head, but within my applications that I'm able to go to, I get to see how everything is determined because they're published where I want to see within my company. And so it's not just within the technical writer field, but if you're a developer or if you're a coder, you have similar uh, progression trees so that everyone knows kind of what's expected and be able to grow accordingly. It's actually one of the reasons why I left my proposal writer job to be a technical writer again, because the, being a proposal writer, you just kind of stuck and there's no real sense of flow. I know. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Um, and also, yeah. going on that same question, like, yeah. would you say like that there's definitely like an age like indicator for each level, or like like they're older, but then the 
I wouldn't say so. Um, I, I would. I won't say that age discrimination doesn't exist, but I know that, especially within mainframe, one of the big issues with mainframe is, is because it's been around for 40, 50, 60 years, a lot of the original workers, developers, coders are now aging out, retiring, and or just leaving. And that's why we need to bring in a new generation to keep mainframe going, because despite all of the prognostications that cloud's going to take over, or we're going to do everything on desktops, mainframe has been very belligerent about staying, just because it is so reliable. It's something called the five nines of reliability, so that's it, 99.99% of the time, it's going to be up and available. So. Also, um, second question. Yeah. Those are just some of our customers. That would be a better way for me to describe it. Is that um, we provide the mainframe, and then we have a core community sales department that goes out to uh, IBM or GPU or um, And so they get the information. Yeah, they they get those um, clients. Uh, the clients are also very uh, static as well. We don't really see much movement. So that's, um, that's a better way of talking about it, is we provide the structure and then the other companies tell us what they want our hardware to do. So um, I hope that makes sense. Yes. Any other questions? So besides there not being a huge job market for history majors, what led you from history to tech on? Yeah. So if any of you have been in any of Dr. Becker's classes, um, he goes through the various types of tech writers, how you end up coming into being in this field. I was very much so an accidental tourist. Um, my wife was a tech comm major first, and I started seeing a lot of what she was doing, especially in design. And when I was seeing her do her classwork, that seemed to me to be pretty cool. And I wanted to do that myself. And then. Um, realizing that if I wanted to make history a career, it would take away from my family, from my relationship, and that it would be much harder to get a toehold into the professional field. I decided I'd just switch. I was working at UNT at the time, so I got the class, the tuition discount, being a staff member. So I uh, stood across and within about uh, three or four semesters, went from a zero to a combat round to uh, four. You just want to go explore? <laughs> no. Oh, it's okay. I'll be recorded on camera. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's how I came to be in, in TechCon. Um, just seeing the opportunities, realizing that if I wanted to develop a family, if I wanted to use my earning potential, sliding into tech would be good. I finished my history degree off because I was basically there already and I wasn't going to waste those credit hours that I got. So, yeah. um, I'll also say that having having that second string has also helped, uh, especially because history is a very centric um, field. It was very conducive to also improving my um, essay writing and my research skills as well because the, the two go together very well. Anything else? Oh. Yes. Uh, do you mainly work by yourself or do you work in teams on projects? Yes, that's right. So uh, um, a typical day, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. So my typical day is very much so I'm on an island for the most part. I'm the only documentation person on my teams. I, I, and part of the team of about six to eight people from a product owner to a product specialist to a couple of coders, developers, um, QA, people, qualitative analysis, as well as testers. And so we have, uh, twice a week we have what we call stand-ups where they all come in and we say what we're working on, uh, what we've done the previous week, what we are working towards, and if we have any problems or issues that we can resolve as a team. Um, 
But for the most part, my days consist of uh, me and a few people from the laptop just uh, working away with whatever it is that I'm, I'm working on. Um, right now, because we are in the migration, it is um, that's taking up a lot of my time because we're going from one tool to another tool, and that's always full of challenges that we're trying to resolve. But um, we should be moving towards um, documentation creation sooner than later. Does that answer that question? Yeah. yeah. yeah that is. How long would you say you're given to be, like do a task? And um, so that, that's the beauty about being um, the only documentation specialist on my team is that when we get together, we do what's called sizing. So we give estimates for how long we expect to complete something. And right now, I am pretty broad in what I would say to my finders, just because A, it's a new tool, B, I'm just trying to get familiar with everything that I'm doing. Um, but the more I grow in experience, the more specific and precise I can be with that time. And uh, the stand-ups help us um, stay on track. And it's part of what's more broadly called the agile product cycle. So instead of, so the old way used to be what's called waterfall. So a client comes in with something and it moves all the way through and then at the very end we figure out if the client actually wanted that or not. Whereas in agile, we have checks periodically throughout everything so that we're able to stay on track and if we realize that something is growing beyond scope or we need more time or it's actually taking less time, we're able to adjust more frequently, hence agile. And um, that's, that's what the methodology that we use and it's something that is increasingly common throughout the industry, not just in Broadcom, but it's also something that my previous job at Tyler Technologies as a proposal writer, that's what they were also doing as well as using the Agile methodology. Oh, at the back. So, um, on the whole Agile thing, is that mm -hmm. um, because you're kind of owned you basically, right? Sorry? Because you're your own kind of guy for this mm -hmm. in your team, in a sense. Um, so is that your decision to use that method, or is that like a company policy thing normally? Does it depend it, on the company? Yeah, so it's led by the company. Okay. It's not just the documentation person, because um, in the waterfall method, like I referenced, documentation usually happens at the very end. So yeah. you get given everything, and then you're supposed to just finish everything up um, at, the, at that point. And because you're brought in so late, if you're kind of the person holding everything up, so that's how you end up with bad documentation. Um, because you're not part of the process throughout. So by, in the agile method, because you are part of the process all the way through, you're able to start building up your knowledge base, you're able to work with the subject matter experts so that the documentation evolves with the code or it evolves with the product okay. so that okay. you're able to finish together is the main point so that no one section is holding up another section. And, um, I wish I could describe the differences between Waterfall and Agile because I have it in my head. No, I mean, that made it a lot more clear. Yeah. We've, we've talked about it in class, too. Yeah. But uh, my impression is that there's far more agile-centric mm -hmm. places than waterfall places. Okay. Than waterfall places. Um, you talked about uh, your resume before, like mm -hmm. now being like, as lengthy and then lengthy and now being in the, work, in the field for four years. Um, what do you think uh, someone that's about to graduate <coughs> that doesn't have that much experience on the resume can start to make their um, resume stronger than they want to find? Sure. Um, it's about um, showing rather than telling. So for instance, what I would do is I would use my history degree to show that I have and have been trained in research techniques, research writing, going out and finding out about stuff and being able to pass it and bring a conclusion or um, uh, an argument because of that. So even though I don't have a job that has that, I can still show that I can do those tasks depending on what it is that's been done. And so it's taking what you've done, even if it doesn't necessarily completely apply or match up, if you're able to make the case, and as a historian I can make a case about pretty much everything, it's also a the data, um, it's then on whoever is interviewing me or is looking at my resume to decide if 
um, I'm worthy to bring in or not. Um, my baseline, the end thing, and this is something that I tell my wife as well, is I let other people say no, because if you say no, you, it's very similar to what Walter Wayne Gretzky's maxim, the Paul Michael Jordan's maxim, that you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Um, I let other people make the determination that I'm not necessarily the right fit to somewhere, rather than trying to say that myself. Now obviously, if they are asking for a software developer, I'm not going to apply for that because I don't have any software development experience and I can't make the case, I can't call anything, but um, I, I look for certain uh, keywords and then I also use my personal background, so I got one job, my, actually my first job outside of UNT, by talking about how I would explain IT concepts to my grandma and work with patients to get her to actually know something rather than doing it for her. And because the role was exactly that, but for a company-wide audience, talking about how to update Windows or reset passwords or um, go find troubleshooting articles, that's part of what helped me get that job, even though technically I didn't have that kind of IT help desk experience. So, um, it's all about taking something that you've done and talking about it in an interview quite often or in a cover letter to say, I may not have this formally, but in an informal setting I have actually done this and I'm pretty successful at it, so that's why you should hire me. She is 14 months old. Yeah. She's big. Yes, she's tall. Got a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing because when she came out, we thought she had a lot of hair then, but we look back at the photos, especially from around Christmas, and we're like, she has a way more hair right now. <laughs> right? Can you show it when you know, Emma? Where's your nose? Thank you so much. Sure, thanks so much. And um, I think Aaron has my contact information. You're welcome Absolutely. to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if you just want um, to ask me anything in private that you wouldn't want to do in a public setting. I get it. Um, feel free. And then on a personal note, I may be overstepping my bounds a little, but I'm going to do this anyway. Uh, make sure you're registered to vote. Um, I was the 64 candidate last cycle for this area um, on the Democratic side, and the biggest way that you can impact your future is registering to vote, making sure that you can vote, and even if you, um, you can use any address within this area in order to get your voter registration card and then go vote early and often. We have our next election coming up in November, there's 10 constitutional amendments that are going to be on the ballot. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.